Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this live stream presentation, The North American Wild Turkey, an enchanting bird in the land of enchantment with Pat Dorsey. I am Ashley Lusher, the Gift Shop and Programs Coordinator at the Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. I will be the moderator tonight. The Los Alamos Nature Center is currently closed, but we still have lots of ways you can interact and connect with nature. Check the PEAK website, peaknature.org, for more live stream presentations like this one on your own activities, like trail passports, and even some small group in-person programs. PEAK is able to offer programs at this time because of our wonderful members and donors. So I'd like to send a special shout out to you for your generous support. So everybody, this is Pat Dorsey. Um, she is the National Wild Turkey Federation's Director of Conservation Operations in the West Region. She has a degree in wildlife biology and worked for 28 years for Colorado Parks and Wildlife before moving to the NWTF. She has extended knowledge in wildlife, habitat, and people management. Uh, more importantly, she is a lover of wildlife and the outdoors. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Pat and we'll monitor for any questions or comments coming in. So as Ashley said, my name is Pat Dorsey. I work for the National Wild Turkey Federation and I'm the Director of Conservation Operations for the West Region. So I have New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana and everything west of there. And the Turkey Federation is pretty active in New Mexico. We've done a couple of um, forest projects with the US Forest Service around Grants, New Mexico. And we've worked on a variety of projects with New Mexico game and fish as well. So, um, I don't get down to New Mexico often enough, but I, I live in Southwest Colorado. So I, I guess that's almost close enough. I don't, I don't get Denver television. How's that? Um, so I wanted you all to know that I thought turkeys were pretty cool even before I worked for the NWTF. And so uh, given this program about a week before Thanksgiving, it seems appropriate that we have some fun with uh, wild turkeys and we talk about their natural history some of their cultural importance and some conservation facts. And the idea behind this is maybe instead of talking about politics or football at your uh, Thanksgiving dinner, you can have some turkey trivia time. There we go, let's start there. So with that, um, I think turkeys are beautiful birds. Maybe this is a face that only a mother can love, I'm not sure, um, but Oftentimes they're called a copper peacock. And you can see with these birds, and these are poults. Um, so they're about the ugliest turkey there is. They were born probably in May or June. And the, this photograph was taken in September. And so these are young birds, but in the when they get the sun on them, you can see that coppery sheen on their feathers. It's got a beautiful iridescence. You can see reds and yellows and greens and blues and blacks. Um, they're actually pretty incredible birds. In fact, you might say, that they were so beautiful that Ben Franklin proposed the wild turkey become the national bird instead of the bald eagle. What do you guys think about that? Is that true? So I guess in the spirit of the election, we'll do a little fact checking here. Uh, the answer is not really, but sort of. So Ben Franklin never proposed that the wild turkey become the national symbol. Ben Franklin actually wanted Moses to become, um, to be on the great seal of the United States. Congress didn't like that idea. And in 1782, instead, they approved putting the bald eagle as a symbol of the United States. So later, in a letter to his daughter, Ben Franklin wrote, here's my best Ben Franklin imitation. <clears throat> For my own part, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen as a representative of our country. The bald eagle is a bird of bad moral character that does not get his living honestly. And to a certain degree, Ben Franklin is right. The bald eagle is a scavenger, so it's usually picking up kills that other animals have made. He called the, wild, the North American wild turkey a much more respectable bird 
and a true original native of, of America. He considered the eagle a rank coward and the turkey a bird of courage that would not hesitate to attack the grenadier of the British guards who would presume to invade his farm with a red coat on. But Ben Franklin never told anybody that. The media found out about it later and stories began to circulate. And I think we all know how that works. So in addition to turkeys being birds of courage and having good moral character, they are flamboyant. The males are called toms, the females are called hens, and the young birds are called chicks or poults as they get a little bit older. But these toms have a large tail fan that they use when they do a sexual display. Um, during that display, their head will actually change color. It'll go from their normal gray and it'll switch to red and white and blue and black to, back to red or white. Um, so their head is constantly changing. Also in the spring, they'll strut around with their tail fanned out. Um, and they'll puff up their feathers like this guy has got his feathers puffed up on his back. Um, they'll actually drag their wings um, and gobble and drum. And so the males are, um, will breed with multiple hens. And outside of the breeding season, they don't hang out with hens at all. They hang out with other males. Um, and that they leave the hens to raise the chicks on their own. Usually you'll have two or three hens together and they'll be raising their, uh, their nestlings together as a group, a small family group. So turkeys are also what I would call unusual. Um, out of the center of that turkey's chest where that arrow is pointed, that's a beard. And uh, a beard is actually a mo modified set of feathers that look like their hair. Um, usually toms are the only birds that will have a beard, but occasionally you'll get a bearded hen. Her beard is usually a lot thinner and not as long. Excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, I hit the wrong button. Um, so turkeys also have a snood, a wattle and caruncles. And so the snood is this fleshy uh, per piece of uh, skin that is going over this turkey's beak. And you can tell the gender of a bird, you can tell how healthy a bird is, and you can also tell whether or not he or she is excited by the length and the size of this snood. The wattle is this piece of skin that connects the bottom of the beak to the neck. And these caruncles are all of these fleshy protuberances along their neck. Um, I'm not sure what the function of the caruncles are other than um, I'm thinking they have something to do with the intensification of the blood flow and help with this changing of the, the colors of this turkey's head from red, white, and blue. So you may or may not think turkeys are beautiful, but I hope that one thing you'll take away is that the wild turkey is not a dumb farmyard bird like his domestic cousins. Um, turkeys can run about 25 miles an hour and they can fly at about 55 miles an hour for a distance of up to a mile. Uh, adult wild turkeys stand about 40 inches tall and the toms will weigh about 17 pounds. Females are about half that size, so females only weigh about eight pounds. I think the thing that's kind of interesting is when you think about a bird that's 40 inches tall and weighing 17 pounds, it can disappear into the forest like with the blink of an eye. They're amazing. And they have incredible eyesight. Speaking of blinking eyes, if you blink your eye, I think they could see you move. Um, they're that keen um, when it comes to their vision. So at this point, Ashley, does anybody have any questions about just how beautiful turkeys are? Um, yes, we have gotten a question. Somebody is wondering, what is the purpose of the snood? So the purpose of the snood, I think, is really uh, just a tool that might show um, 
just how fit a particular male is for breeding. Uh, because when he gets excited, that will get longer and brighter colored and all of that kind of stuff. So it actually helps turkeys um, even read each other's excitement level. How's that? And health. Interestingly about a snood too, uh, if you look back in the like Victorian era, like the 1920s, there, there was a woman's hairnet that uh, would, would keep all of her hair contained in, in this little uh, crocheted hairnet, so to speak. And that was also called a snood. So I'm not sure if the turkey snood got named before the hairnet or the hairnet got named based on the turkey snood. That's really fascinating. That's great. Uh, we don't have any other questions about the appearance just now. So I think we're ready to move on. All right. Thank you. So I also wanted to talk about turkeys um, in addition to just being sort of interesting birds biologically. They're also extremely talkative and they've got um, a, a lot of abilities to communicate different things and they have a lot of different calls and that kind of thing. So I wanted to go over them um, a little bit so we can, we can really talk turkey here for a minute. So I want you to imagine you're going out in the spring of the year and uh, you're going on a hike and it's still dark, but you can start to see some faint light on the horizon. You grab your backpack out of the back of your car and you're about to set off on this hike. So you slam your car door and you hear. And it kind of sounds like a turkey gobbling or a turkey gargling or something real quickly. But what they'll do at night is they go up to a roost, they roost high in a tree and they'll pick a, usually the, the highest tree that has a fairly open canopy that they can fly up into fairly easy. Um, so they'll fly up into that tree and before they fly down in the morning, they'll gobble. Now turkeys also do something that they call a shock gobble. So literally you'll slam a car door or uh, a crow will call and um, a male turkey will respond with a gobble. So I mentioned male turkeys, they do this primarily in the spring and they do it to let the hens know they're around. Um, I've heard turkeys gobble though in the middle of the winter. So I don't know what brings on that gobbling in the winter, but in the spring, a lot of people think that turkeys gobble so that, uh, you know, they, they and they will go to the hens. A turkey, turkey is actually gobbling and saying, hey, I'm pretty handsome. I think you ought to come check me out. So um, that's what the turkey gobble is all about. Another sound that you'll hear, and a lot of times after a turkey gobbles, you might hear something like this. called a yelp and uh, turkeys yelp it's kind of the human equivalent of a word um, they use yelps for all sorts of communication so the females will be talking to the gobblers in the spring they'd be talking to each other they're they're just kind of going I got some good food over here why don't you come that's just how they talk so that's the most common turkey sound you'll hear in the woods and before I go any further can is the volume okay is everybody hearing those sounds okay and not getting their ears blown out or anything? Um, I'm being able to hear all right, but I've got one comment saying they weren't able to hear the Yelp, um, but it looks like other people are saying they were able to hear all right. So maybe if we could hear the Yelp one more time, just in case somebody's computer was taking a second to catch up. Uh, but otherwise, I think for the majority of everyone, this sounds perfect. Okay, let's give it another try. All right, 
So I mentioned that Yelps are like words. They can communicate a variety of things. And so depending on how loud they yelp, how long they yelp, or how excited they are about it, um, those Yelps convey a variety of things. And one of the things about turkeys is, is they're very gregarious, which means they like to hang out with other turkeys um, or a, fl a flock. So one of the things that'll happen oftentimes, in, especially in the fall, like if you're on a hike and you happen to bump a group of turkeys, you might only see one turkey fly but chances are you bumped a group of turkeys and separated them. And what they'll do is they'll call each other back together. They do what they call an assembly call. And it's hens in particular, trying to call all of her poults back together. And in this photograph, the bird on the left is an adult hen and the four smaller birds to the right of her are, are her poults. And she'll call them back or do an assembly call, say, hey, let's all get back together. Okay, in that call, you heard her call a lot longer with a lot of short yelps. And then I think you may have even heard some of the pults answer back like, peep, peep, I'm over here. And hence going, let's get back together. Let's get back together. And they're, they're peeping so they know where each other are. Okay, so not only are turkeys talkative, I say they're also emotional. So when turkeys are content, they will actually purr. And this is a quiet sound. So get everybody ready for this one. This is a turkey purr. Oops, excuse me. Turkey purr. So for those of you that couldn't hear, it was kind of like a and that's when the birds are content. A lot of times you'll hear feeding birds. They're feeding along. They're not worried about anything. The food is good and they're happy. They're content. You'll hear that call. Now, when they get alarmed, you'll hear another call that's called a putt. Whoops. <laughs> So you heard a few yelps in there, but you also heard this putt, which is a what, what, what. And if anybody on this call is a turkey hunter, that's the last call you want to he hear because that's a turkey that says, I sense danger around here and I am not hanging out one second longer. I'm out of here. So if, if you're in the woods and you're on a hike, you're not a turkey hunter, but you hear that noise, you know that a turkey just spotted you and a turkey is probably headed the other direction. That's a bird you'll never see. All right. So in addition to being beautiful, flamboyant, emotional, talkative birds, I hope I'm not overselling turkeys too much here. But turkeys are always important to the Native Americans as well. And one of the reasons I think turkeys were so important to Native Americans is that they were native to much of the United States. So the Eastern half of the United States and most of the West had wild turkeys. There were a few about, turkeys were native to about 39 states in, North, in the United States. Um, so they weren't native to like California and the Northwest. Um, but much of the rest of the United States, they were always native. And so the Native Americans, almost every culture used them, almost every culture ate them. Um, they hunted them with a variety of methods. They trapped them with snares. They shot them with bows and arrows. Um, they built hunting blinds and they would call turkeys in by blowing through a leg bone to make a yelping sound like the one that we heard a little bit earlier. And uh, interestingly enough, they ate them a variety of ways too. They roasted them, they boiled them, they stewed them, they stuffed them, they used them in soup, and they even brined them and, and smoked them. So when I think about it, that how the Native Americans 
used turkeys and how they hunted turkeys was not all that different from how we do it today. Um, and I think it's important that we continue to keep this, this part of people on the landscape. So on the um, left-hand side of the slide, you'll see a Native American hunter who's in the spring of the year. You can tell by the flowers blooming and he's after turkeys with his bow and arrow. And on the right side here is down in the southeastern part of the country and um, a Native American hunter out with a blowgun. So beyond just the turkey meat, turkeys were almost more important for their feathers, which I thought was kind of interesting, but there were some tribes that didn't even eat turkey, but they used their feathers. They were important for ceremonies. Um, they used the wing feathers and, and um, this, this right here is actually a turkey wing and that's a turkey, that's a fan that's made out of a turkey wing, probably for ceremonial purposes, but they also use these feathers, which are really stiff to fletch their arrows so their arrows would fly straight. Um, they took turkey feathers and they wove them into blankets and cloaks and sandals and other textiles. Turkey bones are hollow and so they make um, perfect uh, whistles and flutes they could make tubular containers out of them. They could cut them and make beads and other trinkets. And so um, they really had a lot of use for turkey parts. And this photo here on the left is of a New Mexico archeologist. Her name is Mary Wiaki. And she recreated this turkey feather cape that was like some of the ancient tribes wove. Um, this particular cape used 17,000 turkey feathers. And she had um, a guy at the New Mexico Game and Fish Department who's actually an avid hunter um, save his turkey feathers. And then he asked other turkey hunters in New Mexico if they would volunteer and give up their turkey feathers for this project and they did. Um, so, and I know that personally I've been asked by uh, the Acoma and some of the other groups that, that use a lot of turkey feathers. This photo here is actually of a winter boot that was made of turkey feathers. And this was found in Mesa Verde National Park. So the other interesting thing about turkeys and Native Americans is that there's a lot of evidence that Native Americans actually domesticated turkeys. And so one of the first things that people often hear about is that, um, someone moved turkeys from Mexico down to Guatemala about 2000 years ago. And they, they started domesticating turkeys down there. Um, and so there was a lot of evidence also in, in the Southwest. Um, there are like nine sites in the Four Corners area. And then there are a bunch of sites farther South in New Mexico and Arizona that show that the Native Americans were domesticating turkeys. And a lot of people assumed that they did the same thing. They assumed that they went down to Mexico, got these turkeys and brought them up here. But after doing some DNA analysis and they can do DNA now on bones and feathers and all that kind of stuff, they actually found that they were getting turkeys from around here, domesticating them, and then they were doing their own. They would share them with other tribes and that kind of thing. The reason that this photo is in here is this is a photograph of Turkey Pen Ruin which is actually in Utah. Um, people assumed this was a turkey pen by what was left of the structure, but I think they, they later determined that it was some sort of a granary and actually the mud actually fell off the outside of the granary. It's not a turkey pen at all. So it's probably not a really great slide, but, uh, but I thought it was pretty cool called Turkey Pen Ruin. All right, so the interesting that how did the, how did the turkey make it to our Thanksgiving table? So they think a couple of things happened that are are probably critical to the turkey becoming the staple on our Thanksgiving table. And one is that when the Spanish came to the Americas, they encountered the Mayans and other tribes. They had turkey here, and fell in love with the bird and took it back to Europe where it became an important staple on the dinner table. 
and and turkeys probably really went crazy with domestication in Europe. But the other reason I think turkeys are such an important part of our Thanksgiving table is because of our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, who declared Thanksgiving a national holiday in 1863. So before I move on to some conservation stuff, are there any questions about the importance of these birds culturally? Um, I haven't gotten any questions about their cultural importance yet, but somebody did ask about how many turkeys would it take to collect enough feathers to make those blankets and uh, shoes that you were showing? So that cape had 17,000 feathers, and I think there are about 600 feathers that could be used for a cape on a bird. So that's a lot of birds. I, I think, um, if I rem I'm remembering correctly, it was something like it took 68 uh, turkey pelts to make that cape. So I, I think about, you know, if, if you think about that in cultural terms, um, and, and like that pair of winter boots that we saw from Mesa Verde, um, they had to be incredibly abundant. And, and that, that probably also indicates in the Southwest, so New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, that they were domesticating these birds. Because one of the things I always think about is if, if you're a hunter, it's a great way to get meat, but it's not a guaranteed way to get meat. So if you needed a consistent supply or a, a reliable supply of turkey meat and turkey feathers, they almost needed to domesticate those birds to get that many. Great, thank you for answering that. We've got some other questions as well, um, but none of them go quite along with what we just learned about. So I'll save them for the end. Okay, thanks Ashley. So um, I wanna talk a little bit now just specifically about New Mexico because New Mexico is incredibly lucky when it comes to wild turkeys. And that's because you have three subspecies of wild turkey in your state. And um, if you look at this map, this uh, tan color, I'm not sure how it's showing up on your screen, but this color here, um, this is the Miriam's wild turkey. And Miriam's are probably the most, obviously they're the most widely distributed bird in New Mexico but they are also the most abundant bird in New Mexico. So when you look at this one, it goes from the Colorado border really all the way, you know, to, to the border with, with, uh, with Mexico, right? It goes, goes all the way to your Southern border. Um, and it goes pretty much all the way from the West side of the state to the East side, because these populations here that are in green are are both Miriams and Rio Grande subspecies. So the, the Miriams birds are birds that like to live in the forest. And when I think about Miriams, I think about them as being birds that indicate that the forest is healthy because you have big ponderosa pine trees, you have nice open meadows, you have um, wet meadows for foraging, you have all of the things that indicate that forest was probably like it was originally. Um, these populations that are along these little riparian corridors, I shouldn't say little riparian corridors, major river corridors, but are shown here in these little purple stringers are Rio Grande wild turkeys. And then down here in the corner um, in the light blue are Gould's wild turkeys. And I'm gonna talk about each of those subspecies in a little bit more detail right now, but I wanted you to see this map first. So these are your Miriam's wild turkeys. And the best way to tell these wild turkey subspecies apart is by the color of this tail band. So on Miriam's, the tail band is kind of an ashy white color. And I mentioned already, they're the most abundant in your state. Um, and a really incredible mascot of a healthy forest. So whether you think they're beautiful or not, I think uh, just thinking about having turkeys as an indicator of having a healthy forest says a lot about your state. 
and how you manage your habitat. And I apologize to you for hitting the wrong button. Um, so this is a real grand wild turkey that lives in those riparian corridors. And if you look at his tail band, it's almost a chocolatey or a golden brown. And these birds are found mostly again on those riparian areas in central and northeastern New Mexico. And then we've got the Gould's wild turkey. So if you look at this turkey's tail band, it's bright white and he's got so, the tips of his other feathers are tipped in white to the degree that it almost looks like he's wearing a lace skirt or something here. He's got a white rump. Now what's cool about Gould's wild turkeys is that around well, the late 1800s, 1890s, 1900s, these turkeys were basically extinct in New Mexico. Um, there were very, very few of them. And your state has worked very hard. Um, New Mexico Game and Fish, in fact, traded 40 pronghorn antelope to Arizona in exchange for 60 gould turkeys to start building up your populations here. Um, so the thing that's also unique about Gould's turkeys is they're the largest wild turkey of any subspecies. So they're huge. They've got great big, huge feet. They've got great big, long legs. Um, they've got incredible tails. And these turkeys are so big, you almost think, how can that thing get off the ground? They look like the B-52 bomber of the turkey world. They're absolutely huge. The other thing that's kind of cool about your state I, I just think it's really neat. They take one Gould's wild turkey tag and they raffle it off. And they take another Gould's turkey tag and they auction it off. Each tag brings in about $10,000 and they use that money only to improve habitat and to bring more Gould's turkey transplants to the state of New Mexico. So you went from having zero birds to having a real stable population of about a hundred birds. In fact, um, I got my first call from a landowner in New Mexico who was actually complaining that you had too many Gould's wild turkeys. So I think that's a good sign, um, except for, I'm sorry for that particular landowner who was being pestered by a Gould's turkey, but um, it's pretty neat to have these birds. I've never seen one in the wild. Um, I would love to, they're, they're incredible, so. I want to talk a little bit about national conservation of the wild turkey because I think a lot of people take for granted that they are uh, always common, but they're like a lot of wildlife populations in North America in that pre-settlement there were a lot of them. We estimate the population up around 10 million. But after settlement and by the turn of the century, we had a lot of things going on. We had people cutting down forests. We had market hunting where people would actually, turkeys taste good. So they would kill as many of them as they could and sell them at a market in a big city like Denver. Um, and so the population of the wild turkey in North America was down to around 200,000 birds from 10 million down to 200,000 birds by 1900. So around 1937 or so, we launch into an era as a country where we start to recover a lot of wildlife populations. And I don't think a lot of people realize elk were an endangered species at one time, deer were an endangered species at one time. And so it was a good thing in 1937 that we started um, taking care of our wildlife and bringing them back. So what's started to happen, people realized that we needed to get more turkeys on the landscape. And so they were doing a lot of transplanting turkeys. But what happened early on is people were grabbing turkeys out of the wild and raising them in captivity and then turning them loose back into the wild. And th those projects were not successful. Um, around 1959, what started happening is people realized that you would take wild turkeys from a place where they had a lot of wild turkeys and they would move them to a place where they didn't have any wild turkeys. And what they found is that when you took birds from the wild and you released them to another place in the wild, 
They knew how to avoid predators. They knew how to find food. They could find a roost tree at night. They knew all of that stuff. And so the program started being successful. By about 1959, we had 31 states that were working on wild turkey restoration. And by about 1974, we had brought this population back up to about a million and a half birds. I'm gonna talk about the National Wild Turkey Federation just for a minute because in 1973, um, the, the National Wild Turkey Federation was formed by a group of turkey hunters for the most part. And what they said is, gosh, if, if we could get up to you know 1.4 million birds by having 31 states doing all these different things, what could we do if we coordinated wild turkey restoration as a nation? And so they got together with the universities and they got together with the state wildlife agencies and they started working together to restore the bird across the country. And today we have about 7 million birds in the United States. We have, in fact, we may have done a little too good of a job. We have 7 million birds in 49 states. Uh, there are 7.8 million birds in North America. And so that means that about 80% of the birds that exist are in the United States. Um, I think it's about 10% in Mexico and another 2% in Canada. And that doesn't quite add up right, but that's I think a rounding error as much as anything. So the good news is the wild turkey is not on any kind of endangered species list. It's not on any federal state bird watch list. They're pretty abundant. Um, they're able to integrate back into the culture. So people are uh, still enjoying them on the table. It's nice to have a, a wild turkey on a table. The US Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that about two and a half million people in the United States hunt turkeys. In the West, we don't have too many turkey hunters. I think because we have elk and deer and antelope and black bear and so many other species to hunt. But um, at, in the country, about two and a half million people hunt turkeys. And the turkey is the second most popular game animal only to the white-tailed deer. So with that, it's, I'd like to uh, end my presentation here and wish you all a happy Thanksgiving and take any questions. Perfect, thank you, Pat. We've actually got quite a few questions. Um, I'm gonna see if, oh, so sorry. I think we started a, sorry, give me one second. There we go, sorry about that. Got a little messed up in my keyboard. Um, I have a few questions here to ask about some of these cool turkeys. Um, first off, do males hang out together during the off breeding season? They do. And actually you'll see some really large flocks of males together. They're pretty incredible to see because they, all, they will have those long beards. And so you'll see these groups of long beards, they call them, walking around together. Now, what is kind of interesting is as it gets closer to the spring, um, they start fighting for dominance. And um, particularly the young male birds, which are called jakes, we talked about um, toms being mature males, but the, the teenage males, so to speak, are, the, are called jakes. And they will, um, they get extremely aggressive. They'll actually wrap their necks and you can't see, I guess what my hands are doing, but they'll actually wrap their, their necks around each other and, and can actually kill each other in fights for dominance. So, so who would know that these big gangly birds are big, you know, you know, I want to say, uh, what's the right word, but they're, they're hardcore too, you know, um, at establishing dominance. Wow, that's really cool. Um, next question, uh, do they favor a particular type of tree when they're roosting? So with, um, with wild turkey, the Miriam's turkeys in particular, um, ponderosa pine forests are the most common place that you'll find them, but they like an open canopy ponderosa. So if you find a, uh, 
a ponderosa pine that has big open branches there. And if you could imagine yourself being a turkey and trying to fly into something, if there's a bunch of branches, you're not gonna make it, right? But if there's some open branches, um, it's perfect. Um, in those riparian corridors, they'll be in those big cottonwood trees that are in the bottom and they'll usually pick the tallest tree down there um, so that they are up high and they can see and they feel safe. One of the things, if y'all are walking around in the woods to look for, you find a ponderosa pine tree that has piles of turkey poop around it, at, you will know that that is a roost tree. Um, same goes for those river bottoms because they will roost in the same tree often at night. And, um, and when they do, they must poop all night long is what I'm saying, because there will be a ton of it underneath those trees. Oh, well, perfect. I know we have a lot of uh, ponderosa pines here around Los Alamos. So I'm sure getting out into the mountains, it's a great place to look for some wild turkeys. Um, how many toms are typically in a flock? You know, that really depends. So um, in the winter, I've seen pretty big groups of toms, you know, 30 birds together. Um, but other times you find a lot smaller birds. So I think it depends on how many you have in your area, how good the habitat is. And it's really seasonal too, because mm -hmm. what I find is the flock size varies. Um, you know, in, in the dead of winter, there are a lot of big flocks, that, um, probably because there's less suitable habitat. So they all have a tendency to be in the best habitat. Um, but as things start to warm up or um, it's early on in those seasons of flock sizes will be a little bit smaller. Great, perfect. Um, how many of the turkey sounds that we had heard um, are used and mimicked while hunting and are there calls that are better to use while hunting uh, better than others? So, um, that assembly call, you know, to bring everybody back together or, or just a Yelp um, is a good one. And, and a lot of times hunters will do stuff like they'll combine a Yelp call with a purr. So you're going, yep, 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 right? Um, that says, I'm content, I've got good food, you know, I'm, I'm here, that kind of thing. The, the one call that um, we advise people not to use when they turkey hunt is a gobble. And, and the main reason is, for those that are non-hunters, is um, the only bird that can be legally hunted in the spring is a gobbler. And so if you're sitting in full camouflage, because remember how good their eyesight is, you're sitting in full camouflage, sounding like a gobbler, you, the chances of you calling in another hunter are pretty good. Mm -hmm. So we advise people not to, not to do that um, and rather to make yourself sound like a hen and, and perfect your Yelp call if you're interested. Gotcha, that makes sense. Um, you mentioned that there are some turkey studies going on in Grants, New Mexico. What are the landscapes uh, that those studies took place in and are those studies published anywhere? So I apologize. I um, If I said studies, I didn't mean to say studies. We're actually doing some habitat work there mm -hmm. so that the forest will be more resilient to uh, devastating wildfires so that it's more those natural conditions that we talked about, the big um, open parkland, big ponderosa um, habitat type that existed here, you know, when probably when we got here as, as white settlers, um, those, were, those were the forest conditions that we had in the Southwest. Gotcha, all right. I know that here in Los Alamos, we are very familiar with wildfires. We've had a couple in the past 20 years. And so we're doing our own restoration on some of those uh, burn scars still. It can take some time to get back to what it once was. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting with wildfires in the West. You know, we all, I think all of the Western states share this uh, severe drought, warming climate. We've been suppressing forest fires for years. 
Um, we haven't been actively managing our forests. And so now we're getting these real dry conditions and mm -hmm. we're all really prone for wildfires, you know, and, and I sit in Colorado and I watch the fire season usually starts in Arizona and New Mexico, it works its way through Colorado and it ends up in Oregon and Montana, but we never know which state is gonna, um, you know, bear the brunt of those fires. It seems like it moves around. So we all need to do our part, I guess, I guess to help, help with that. Yes, for sure. Um, do the, correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, the ground turkeys weigh more than other subspecies? Yeah, they do. And I apologize, I don't have a weight of the Gould's turkeys, but they are, um, they are huge. And um, I, I will look them up for you. But, but that is one that is a pretty interesting bird. And so when, as you can imagine, if, if the state of New Mexico invested as much time and effort as they did into restoring Gould's turkeys into New Mexico, when they brought those turkeys in, they put little backpacks on them with radios. And so there's a lot of data on Gould's turkeys and how they're using the landscape. And um, New Mexico Game and Fish has an excellent website, actually. The, the biologist in the state is named Casey Cardinal. She's, she's a brilliant woman and um, has done a lot of Gould's turkey work. So I encourage you to go to the website and, and read more on them because they're there, it's a really unique success story and New Mexico has a lot to be proud of. Oh, well, thank you. Um, is there any evidence of bottlenecks when it comes to uh, the turkey populations, uh, similar to the way they are for deer populations? So um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by bottleneck. Do you mean like a, um, you know, factors that limit wild turkey populations, is that what we're thinking? I believe or? so, yes. Oh, okay. um, founders effect as well. This okay. is what I'm hearing from our uh, questioning viewer. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, and so I'm, I'm not quite sure of the question that you're asking, but um, oftentimes what limits um, wild turkey populations, and it's, it's different in different places, um, but in areas that have good mast, you'll have more turkeys. So in places where you have gamble oak and a lot of that kind of stuff, you'll have more. Um, in some cases it's brood rearing habitat. So in some cases it's the fact that um, young turkeys need a lot of insects in their diet. So they need those wet meadow habitats with a lot of, um, of uh, insect, a lot of insect protein. If they can't get that, you'll have a bad year where you don't see a lot of production. Another thing that'll hurt turkey populations is if we have a nice warm spring and then we have a late or a wet storm come through, all of those little turkey chicks will have a hard time surviving that cold, wet weather. Um, sometimes in the winter when we get these snowstorms that uh, are pretty severe. A turkey can sit in a tree in the winter time for about two weeks and not eat anything and be just fine. But um, if we get those really bad winter storms in and they're up there for much more than that or they get down out of the tree, maybe get a couple of days worth of food and they get back up there and we get a second storm. Winters can be really hard on turkeys as well. So I think it all depends. Um, roost trees are important. What I've found in um, ponderosa pine habitats is usually there's plenty of roost trees, at least where I'm familiar, um, you know, you, you, uh, you walk on one hillside and there's perfect roost trees all over that one. You go to the next one, there's perfect roost trees all over that. But those roost trees in those riparian corridors can be limiting. So when we manage turkey habitat, we need to think about all of those things. Perfect. And um, we have a question, how many eggs does a hen lay and when do they mate? So they uh, start courting and breeding in April. Um, they'll lay about 12 eggs. They will re-nest if something happens to their first nest. So um, they'll, they'll nest and it gets wiped out by predators or something like that. 
um, they'll re-nest. Uh, and so they'll re-nest through about the, excuse me, until about the end of May. They incubate for about three weeks, um, maybe a little bit longer. Um, one of the things I think is pretty cool about turkeys actually is hens nest on the ground. They don't build a nest like a lot of other birds. They just scratch out a little dry spot on the ground and, and they'll lay their eggs right there. And I have walked past a hen turkey sitting on the ground from uh, a foot away and all of a sudden have a turkey jump up and scare me half to death because they are so camouflaged and, and so dedicated to, to bringing that nest off, they're not gonna leave unless they actually feel forced out of there. So um, they're, it's pretty incredible when you think about what they can do, but um, it's also interesting. I've found uh, turkey eggshells in bear scat. Um, so I know if bear, will, you know, if he finds a turkey nest, they'll eat them. If skunks or raccoons find turkey eggs, they'll eat them. Um, obviously once they hatch, they're pretty tiny and the hawks and other birds can pick them off, but they, that's why they re-nest and that's why they lay so many eggs in the first place. Nice, it's good to know. Um, how is climate change impacting the habitat use of turkeys? You know, um, I don't know if I have a great answer for that, but we talked actually a little bit ago about um, wildfires. Mm -hmm. and, and I honestly think that, um, that the risk for wildfires is a big issue and um, and the, and just the forest condition generally, you know, all those things, right? We haven't been managing our forests. Now we have climate change, whether or not our forests burn, um, the, the, the definitely is decreasing the condition of our forest or the, the value of our forest. So um, I think it's like a lot of other animals, they're, um, their habitat is gonna change, right? A along with, with how the climate changes. Gotcha, all right. Um, somebody is wondering if you have any book recommendations for someone interested in learning more about turkey behavior um, and not per only from the hunter's perspective, but more of a uh, biologist or animal behavior perspective. Yeah, um, I have to think on a good book cause there's a, there's a couple of them. But I will tell you, if you ever get a chance, and, and I haven't been on Amazon lately to look this one up, but there's a, um, there's a video and, and um, I, I know it's on VHS. And so that's why I don't know if anybody's actually put it on DVD, but it's called the North American Wild Turkey. And it took them, I think about five years to film all of the footage for that video but they have got a year in the life of a wild turkey on video. So it's got turkey chicks from the day that they break out of their eggshells to the first time they dust themselves off to going out and finding bugs with their mother to Jake's growing up and, and fighting and fighting for dominance and all of that kind of stuff. So it's an absolutely fabulous video if anybody's able to track that down or you see it at a thrift store or something like that, I encourage you to pick it up. Um, there's a lot of good turkey books. There are a lot that are written, um, you know, from a hunter's perspective, but there uh, are a lot of good natural history stuff. And there are a lot of good um, scientific papers that aren't too sciencey that you can Google and, and find online as well. And in fact, there's some good ones that are written um, by biologists in Colorado and New Mexico. So they're very appropriate to our Ponderosa pine forest. Perfect, well, thank you. Um, here's a question. Uh, where I work in the Sandia Mountains, we have Miriam turkeys, Miriam's turkeys. Uh, a female with, with mostly white cream colored feathers has come around and shown up on our wildlife cameras. How common is that variation? It is not super common, um, but there are, you know, albinism or partial albinism in, in turkey populations. It's also possible um, every once in a while we get some birds that hybridize with somebody's domestic flock. Um, it doesn't sound like that's the case. It sounds like you're, uh, 
uh, person from the Sandy Mountains has wild turkeys around and knows what they're looking at. So this is a bird that actually has some partial albinism, which is, is pretty cool. And when you, you think about it, it's a not a great um, survival trait, right? So um, this bird must be extra smart. Nice, perfect. <laughs> Um, what kind of food do wild turkeys eat and what kind of habitats are best for them to find these foods? So again, that all depends on the season. So in the spring, they're eating a lot of green plants. They're eating um, grass, young grass shoots, long, long, young plants that are just coming up. Um, and there's also a bunch of extra seeds that are still laying around from winter and they'll scratch for those. So that's another thing as you're walking through the woods, if you see these places underneath Ponderosa pine trees that look like somebody took a rake and raked under there, it's a good bet that it was a bunch of wild turkeys that went through and they actually will scrape underneath those Ponderosa pine to get the seeds and things like that. Um, in the summer, they'll eat a lot of insects. Um, a friend of mine who is a biologist in Mississippi actually did, uh, turkeys have a crop like a, a lot of other birds do and did a crop analysis of some wild turkeys that were dead and found like a hundred insects in one crop. So they are voracious when it comes to eating insects in the summertime. In the fall, they'll switch over more to seeds um, and they'll continue to eat those in the, in the winter time. Now I've seen turkeys in the winter, like with choke cherries and service berries and things like that. There are usually a few remnant berries. They'll actually get up into the trees and eat those off of the tops of the trees or in the middle of the branches. Wow, that is really cool. Um, so it's now eight o'clock. Um, the program is technically over. However, we do have quite a few questions still. Pat, would you be okay answering a, just a few more questions? Sure, if I have the answers, I'm willing to stay on. I don't know how well I'll do, but. Perfect, well, for anybody who's not able to stay with us any longer, thank you for joining. Um, and anybody who'd like to hang out a little bit longer to hear some more questions, um, we're happy to have you still. Uh, so here we have a question asking about what are a turkey's main predators that they would have to face in the wild? So, um, it all depends. Like I mentioned some of the egg predators already, but owls, um, foxes, bobcats, mountain lions. And it's interesting. So if you think about it, um, we've got our 17 pound Tom um, and he's standing in the forest and he's going, whoa, 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 right? He's making all kinds of racket. And so in the spring, I think Toms in particular are pretty um, vulnerable to predators. And I know um, in the spring when I've turkey hunted, I actually walked in, um, called turkey, had a turkey answer me, ended up not getting a turkey. But as I'm walking back out in my tracks, I have mountain lion tracks inside my tracks. And so that leads me to believe that, that these predators are honed into those uh, birds, particularly in the spring. Um, wow. So. Yeah, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I think cats in particular, so the bobcats and the uh, um, mountain lions in particular, just because they're kind of suited to, um, you know, the short stalks and, and they actually can jump quite high to get them, but. Um, right. Wow. Um, somebody's wondering, what is the purpose of the beard on turkeys? I have no idea, to be <laughs> honest with you. It's kind of a strange adaptation. Um, you know, the, the only thing I can think of, again, because they're sexually dimorphic and, and males have these big beards, is that it's something related to showing how fit he is. Um, but, but I don't know for sure. I know that um, there, there's something about these beards on these birds when you see them walking around, even, um, I don't know, if you know nothing about turkeys, you'll see those bearded birds and just be really attracted to them for some reason. Awesome, perfect, thank you. Um, I'm assuming the answer to this next question is yes, um, but somebody's wondering if you know um, if there are turkeys 
um, wild turkeys living in Los Alamos Camp County or um, Bandelier or the Santa Fe National Forest. And I don't know how many, but I would certainly think that you guys are have turkeys around there. <laughs> so. I, uh, I think so as well from my understanding of the area. So yes, probably quite a few turkeys in the surrounding area. Um, next, do you know anything about the reintroduction of turkeys in the, and excuse my pronunciation, Bosque de El Pachi? Um, I heard it's not doing very well. I do not know about that. Um, I can tell you that, um, and I would be happy to send this information to you, Ashley, and you could forward it to people. Yeah. But online with New Mexico Game and Fish, they have um, all of the turkey transplants that have been done in New Mexico, which is really pretty cool. Um, it goes way back. And um, I wish every state had something like that. So they kept really good transplant records. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll send that to you, Ashley, and I'm sorry I don't know about the bosque. Mm -hmm. No, that's all right. I'm looking forward. I can uh, pass that information along to everybody with our survey email. So that works out perfectly. Um, now we have a question. Do you know who is in charge with the grants project? Uh, I am a master's student analyzing the habitat characteristics of wild turkeys at the RMNWR in New Mexico and would like to get into contact to discuss methods. Um, you know, if you want to, I'll, I'll just give you contact information for me. We have a district biologist who's down there and we actually could use some help um, too. So if you're interested in some extra work, um, we, we may be able to use use you for that um let's definitely have a conversation perfect so i can pass your um info along with the survey email that works great um let's see do turkey turkeys migrate in their habitat seasonally they do um and what i find is in the spring in particular it seems like they follow the snow line up so um, wherever they are in the winter, you can find them at higher and higher elevations as the snow melt. And I think they follow, I don't know if it's they're following the snow melt as much as they're following the green up. Because as that snow melts, you get these, these young plants sprouting right behind that. But they will move up in elevation as the snow leaves. And then they do migrate back down to winter range. And it, it's kind of funny, I all summer long, um, I've seen very few turkeys and all of a sudden I've had them showing up in great big flocks. Um, so they are in, at least in Colorado, in Southern Colorado, they're in the middle of their migration back down toward winter range, I think, and moving through some of that transitional habitat. Perfect. Um, I've written down to our last few questions here. Somebody's wondering what does a turkey footprint look like? What's, what can they look out for when they're hiking the trails? Oh gosh, I can't believe I don't have any turkey track photos. So a, a turkey track will be um, a lot like um, any other bird, only much larger. And so they've got three toes and kind of a back toe. And um, I would say a, a big gobbler track is maybe four inches long and a couple inches wide and then the hen tracks will be smaller than that. Um, if you've seen a, a heron track or something like that they look about like that only you'll find them in a completely different habitat right because you're not finding them around the shore of a lake you're finding them in a in a forest more or less. Uh, and so yeah they're pretty cool. The, uh, the other thing that's uh, you know maybe uh, shows that Native Americans domesticated them is by the number of turkey tracks that you'll find on these Indian uh, art panels, right? Petroglyphs or pictographs oftentimes depict turkey tracks. Nice, well, that's very cool. Um, someone's letting us all know if you're wanting to see some turkeys in the Los Alamos area, there are a lot up by Fenton Lake. Um, so if you go up in that area, you'll hopefully be able to see some really cool wild turkeys. Um, and our last question of the night, um, do we know what the percentage of juvenile turkeys are that survive to adulthood? 
again, that depends on the year. Um, what I would say is if, you know, on average, if, it, if a hen has 12 eggs and she gets half of those to survive, uh, she's done an exceptional job. I would, I would guess that oftentimes it's much lower than that. You know, maybe three or four of that original 12 will make it. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to add for folks is, um, you know, wild turkeys are awesome birds. One of the things they can become is a, a conflict in urban areas because you you'll might have one neighbor who starts feeding them. And uh, ho hopefully we all know that, you know, feeding wild animals is not a great idea to begin with. It's um, a lot of um, fun. I understand why people want to be close to nature, but, but turkeys in particular can become um, kind of a problem for your neighbors if you start something up like that. So I'd encourage everybody to, to, to maintain their uh, environmental ethic there and not feed turkeys. Well, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, those are all our questions that came in from viewers. Pat, thank you so much again for sharing this incredible presentation with us. Uh, you can visit the PEAK website for more information and to register. Thank you again for turning in and thank you, Pat. Well, and I want to thank all the people that were putting their thumbs up or their little hands together. Um, it was really nice getting some feedback from you folks. So have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Bye.